Thank you. We'll uh, move on to the next section focused on uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension uh, with Aditi Singh, who is our heart failure, advanced heart failure fellow. Um, she's going to be presenting a case with a case-based uh, discussion on chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. Good morning. So I'm going to present a case uh, of a patient with C. diff and kind of go over his management. And we could, uh, we'd like to make this an interactive discussion with the panel and the audience over the management and some controversies and issues that we face in these patients. So the, our patient was a 50-year-old male veteran who had been having dyspnea for the last three to four years. Initially, when his symptoms started, he was uh, very disabled and he had trouble just bending over also and just walking from room to room. And then in 2014, he was diagnosed with a PE because of these symptoms, and he was started on Coumadin at that time. When he presented to us finally last year, he actually reported a slight improvement in his symptoms, so he was able to do um, daily activities but had trouble with moderate exertion. So at the time of presentation, he was WHO functional class 2 to 3. He had also been having palpitations, fatigue, lower extremity swelling, had varicose veins, and occasionally had lightheadedness also, but denied any syncope. He had had one episode of syncope, but that was in the setting of him uh, being having a GI illness with vomiting and was supposed food poisoning. Um, other past medical history was just re relevant for DVT and the PE in 2014, and he had sleep apnea and he was compliant with the CPAP. No significant past surgical history. He was a former smoker, but several years ago, he had no family history of DVT, PE, or pulmonary hypertension. When he presented, his heart rate was in the 70s. Uh, blood pressure was 130 over 90, which are relatively good signs for somebody with pulmonary hypertension if they're not tachycardic and if their blood pressure is greater than 90. His oxygen saturation was also 97% on room air. His exam was significant for elevated um, JVP, estimated to be 15 centimeters. His cardiovascular exam was significant for a loud P2 with a holosystolic murmur heard all over the podium. Lungs were clear, um, abdo abdominal exam was significant for an enlarged liver that could be palpated. And he, has, he had venous stasis dermatitis on his lower extremities. Labs showed a hemoglobin of 14, creatinine was slightly elevated, his baseline was around 1.7. His BNP was elevated at 536 and he had a mild troponin elevation also at 0.54. So his initial workup for hypercoagulable state, and that includes an antiphospholipid antibody panel, factor V Leiden mutation, activated protein C mutation, all of those were negative. This was his EKG, which is significant for biatrial enlargement and right axis deviation. So his echocardiogram showed an enlarged right ventricle, function was reduced, left ventricular size was normal, uh, in fact, small, and the left ventricular function was normal as well. And you can see that he had severe TR as well. And in the tissue doppler of the tricuspid annulus, his um, S prime was reduced, showing uh, decreased RV function. So he had a VQ scan. And uh, we can see over here that there's a perfusion defect in the right middle lobe and then significant perfusion defect in the la left lung, especially in the left lingular area as well as left lower lobe. And his ventilation was normal. So CTA is not the preferred diagnostic modality for diagnosing CTEF, but there are findings of chronic thrombi that can be seen in CT angiograms as well. So over here we see a filling defect signifying a chronic thrombus in kind of the right middle lobe arteries. And on this, uh, in this image, as well as in this image, it's clearer. Uh, there's a thrilling defect in the left lower lobe artery. Yes, so one of the points highlighting here is that uh, any patients who have acute P and uh, beyond six months, if they are developing shortness of breath and uh, dyspnea, then they warrant uh, evaluation for chronic thromboembolic uh, uh, pulmonary hypertension. And as Dr. Singh, we uh, showed all these slides, this is pretty much the evaluation which you need for uh, patients with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. 
And one of the uh, major issues which we deal with these patients is early recognition, because even in this patient, when he came, he had some signs of right heart failure. And we obviously want to avoid that, and it's a curable form of a disease if the patient is timely uh, um, identified, picked up, evaluated, and goes to the right place and get things done. Things may be completely different for him. So. Uh, like we in the previous slide, uh, Dr. Singh, we showed the VQ scan, uh, and that's one of the the testing uh, which is highly sensitive and specific for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So, any cardiology clinic or pulmonary clinic or primary care clinic, if you have patients uh, who are coming to you with the unexplained shortness of breath, uh, before you call them psychogenic, get a VQ scan. So. Uh, they may have uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hy uh, hypertension. And uh, not every patient will give you history of uh, pulmonary embolism. So uh, as we know, it's only 4% of patients with acute P who actually end up developing chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So not a lot of patients will be able to provide you uh, uh, history of that. But if you have a patient, and dyspnea is persisting beyond six months, so that needs further evaluation. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a problem that is grossly <coughs> underdiagnosed because if you think about it, uh, the number of um, uh, acute pulmonary embolisms uh, in the U.S. is probably somewhere in the order of three hundred thousand or yeah. so in a year, and so if you take uh, by best estimate, somewhere between three and five percent of patients. So say you take the lower end of that three percent. Uh, of 300,000 really should be nine, 10,000 patients a year who have uh, CTEF in the United States. But the number of operations that are done uh, for it in the U.S. is, uh, is, uh, is about um, 300 a year. Uh, so there's a gross disparity, really, and I think a lot of it, uh, most of it, in fact, has to do with lack of recognition um, of the problem. And, um, and, and so the patients don't get you know, it's not part of a diagnostic, uh, it's not part of the differential diagnosis. It's, you know, people just don't think about it. Is, yeah. would, you, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. one of the point here is that uh, uh, most of the time our ERs, and uh, I think we have done really well in picking up acute pulmonary embolism. Uh, any patient who walks into the ER gets a CAT scan for pulmonary embolism, but uh, one Thing which we should uh, know about this particular disease that chronic PE is, uh, CT angiogram is not a great choice of investigation. So based on that, saying that patient doesn't have a chronic PE, this, this testing is not neither sensitive nor specific for uh, chronic uh, pulmonary embolism. So you need a VQ scan and further testing, which uh, Dr. Singh will go uh, on to discuss further. Uh, for the evaluation of this patient. The other important findings that we can see in the CT scan are enlarged pulmonary artery diameter, which is bigger than the aorta. And I haven't shown images, but his right side of the heart was also very dilated, and we could see that on the CT scan. He had a right heart catheterization, which demonstrated an RA pressure of 12, PA pressure of 66 over 21 with a mean of 37. His wedge was 6. So notably, his right atrial pressure is higher than though is twice that of the wedge. Mixed venous saturation, cardiac output, and index were uh, fortunately still in the normal range. And his PVR was around 5 Woods unit. He had, he had a coronary angiogram also as part of diagnostic evaluation and preoperative evaluation for the surgery, and his coronaries were normal. PFTs done showed an FEV1 that was 62% of predicted, FVC 65% of predicted, and DLCO that was, sorry, that's 54% of predicted. His six minute walk distance was 372 meters, which is also a poor prognostic sign. More than 440 meters is a good sign. And he desaturated to 87% at uh, six meters. So he went on to have a pulmonary angiogram and uh, here in the right lung, we can see that uh, there's a good myocardial blush in the left upper lobe, as I mean, sorry, the right upper lobe as well as the right lower lobe, but there is no perfusion, no myocardial brush in the right middle lobe. And then on the left side, 
there is decreased perfusion to the left upper lobe as well, but really no perfusion uh, to the left lower lobe. And in fact, the left lower lobar artery has an abrupt cutoff. And the other findings that we see are that his arteries are very tortuous also, which signifies ring lesions and stenotic lesions, which is an indicator for long-standing pulmonary hypertension. So yes, uh, um, can you go back to the previous slide? Um, so this is a pulmonary angiogram, and this is considered as a gold standard um, investigation uh, to diagnose uh, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. And as Dr. Singh, we showed on the image on the right, my right, uh, you can see that area of right middle lobe is not getting perfused. And uh, that basically indicates that uh, that there is some occlusion over there. And just looking at that image, uh, we all can appreciate that the pulmonary arteries are very tortuous, going almost to the some peripheral pruning, but very tortuous to the distal level. And that that's very much indicative of long-standing disease that because when the clot organized to the periphery of the vessel and kind of becomes like a scar tissue inside the intima of the pulmonary artery. And then um, it's basically, uh, these are the changes which you see in the vessels uh, uh, develop on long time. Uh, and go going back to the next uh, image. Uh, can you point on some of the stenotic lesions uh, yes. in the upper lobe and uh, with the pointer on the screen? Yeah, like you here. You can see over you can... here that this vessel is very tortuous. So it's narrowed in the middle and it's kind of aneurysmal before and after that also. Yeah, these and are these are the ring lesions uh, seen in uh, chronic thromboembolic, sometimes called as web lesions. You will see out pouching. You will see uh, abrupt cutoff of the vessel. Uh, like in his left lower lobe, I can appreciate there is a abrupt cutoff uh, of the vessel there. So it, these are the signs which you pick up when you see. And, and as you all can appreciate on the image on the right side, um, you don't see the venous blush uh, coming um, in the upper lobe and some area of the left lower lobe, uh, that the, the contrast is going, but uh, it's not uh, perfusing to the periphery of the lung. So, so definite uh, uh, indication that this patient have uh, uh, occlusion of his uh, pulmonary arteries. Uh, it's also striking that uh, it's also important to note that a, quote, negative pulmonary angiogram doesn't necessarily mean the patient does not have CTEF. Uh, the extent of the disease at the time of surgery is always much more extensive than you can appreciate on the angiogram because what we're seeing over here, of course, is a luminogram, and it's, it doesn't really tell you what the extent of the disease is. It's, it's, a, it's a very useful indicator, but you have to use it in conjunction with the other diagnostic modalities. The other thing to, uh, also to take note of is if, if the patient have a, has a large central uh, clot, and I use the word advisedly, but if he has evidence of central obstruction, that does not mean that they have CTEF. Um, in fact, many of his patients won't have CTEF, so that's another thing yeah. that needs to be noted. And other rare possibilities with this disease is always keep in mind that um, if you're evaluation is not, for example, matching with the, the testings are not matching. For example, the perfusion defect on the VQ scan doesn't look like the same as uh, what you are seeing on the PA gram. Keep in mind, there are patients who have vasculitis and they have been misdiagnosed as CTEF. So that's another possibility you have to keep in mind. And some disparity can be seen in, um, in, in patients who have distal peripheral disease because uh, on them, you may not see all these changes, uh, but they have peripheral chronic thromboembolic disease, uh, sometimes more appreciated on the VQ scan than, than PA gram. So you have to kind of uh, put all the testing results together and uh, then make a comprehensive diagnosis of CTEF. So what would you do next after making the diagnosis now? So, uh, many steps involved, like you can see that this needs a very thorough evaluation. And um, as we all know that uh, there are only few centers in the country who consider patient for pulmonary thromboembolic surgery, um, still considered a relatively difficult, technically uh, a difficult surgery and only experienced centers and surgeons can do. And fortunately, we are one of those centers now. We are doing this and we have done successfully 
uh, many in last one year. Uh, so uh, during the evaluation of these patients, uh, it needs a comprehensive multidisciplinary evaluation. We work with our surgeons, our cardiologists, and uh, uh, decide whether the patient needs surgery or the patient needs to go for medical management. In this particular patient, looking at the lesion, um, it, it was felt that he should be going for the surgery, and he did go for the surgery. Uh, Dr. Ramjanan. Yeah, so the surgical evaluation of risk really proceeds uh, with taking similar considerations that you would for any other type of um, um, uh, cardiac operation, uh, where you look at the overall uh, uh, frailty of the patient, you look at comorbid factors, um, um, uh, kidney disease, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the indicators, really, of increased risk in these patients is, is the extent of pulmonary hypertension. It's been shown quite clearly that in patients who have very severe pulmonary hypertension, um, uh, 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 greater than 1,000 dynes, the, 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 the risk of postoperative complications and uh, mortality is higher. It runs around 4 or 5% in the best hands and drops to around 1% if, they, if, they, uh, if the pulmonary vascular resistance is, 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 uh, is less than 1,000 dynes. The other factor that we take into consideration is right heart function. Many of these patients will have dilated right ventricles that don't look as if they're functioning very well, but the fact that they can generate a pressure of 80, 90, 100 sometimes indicates that they, that they, uh, that they actually have uh, better function than than they, than they seem to. But certainly, poor right heart function would be something that would make you uh, step back and, um, and uh, reassess the situation. Um, yeah. So w the reason we do PA gram is obviously to diagnose, and then also we want to know what is the extent of the disease, whether the disease is proximal, distal, or on the peripheral vasculature, and uh, uh, is it surgically surgically amenable or not, or what is the best treatment? So, uh, like in this particular case, we did the surgery and uh, he did really well. Uh, he's um, he was discharged without any issues, and uh, he it's been over a year now, and he has stopped coming to see us. Although we keep calling him, but he doesn't want to. <laughs> he says, I'm doing fine. So he doesn't want to yeah. come. So this, this slide over here shows you the different levels of thrombi, level one being central, level two being in the segmental and subsegmental, and 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 further out. And you would think that, in fact, um, uh, the patients with level one and level two thrombi might be the ones who would benefit the most from this operation. But in fact, that is not the case. They all benefit almost equally from the operation. And in level four, uh, for example, the pulmonary angiogram can be very difficult to interpret. Uh, the VQ scan almost gives you um, yeah. um, a better guide as to yeah. the presence or the absence of disease. The other thing is when you go in, even if you find uh, by preoperative imaging that the disease burden happens to be greater in one segment or one lobe or two lobes or one side versus the other side, as a matter of course during the operation you would regardless of what the preoperative imaging uh, shows, uh, go after every segment in every lobe with equal vigor. And we'll almost always find that in areas where you didn't think there was disease, there is disease. It's very unusual not to find disease in, in, um, in, uh, in, you know, in certain segments if the patient has, uh, really does have CTAV. So, uh, you can also imagine that the technical considerations for doing a thrombectomy at level four are, it's just, it's just more delicate, uh, it, but it can all be done. So he went on to have a pulmonary thromb thromboendotrectomy, and these are the essential principles that I've outlined over here, which uh, Dr. Ramjanani can probably talk more about. Uh, yeah, so um, uh, I think we have a short movie, don't we? Okay. Or do you? Yeah. I, um, yeah, so before we go here, maybe we can go back to the previous slide, so I'll describe the actual steps. So uh, you do a median sternotomy, um, and you do um, aorta and bicaval cannulation. Uh, the plan is to place the, place the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass and to cool them to about 20 degrees centigrade. Um, we don't use EEG monitoring to determine when the EEG is flat, but you can certainly do that. 
Uh, we place fence in and you have to mobilize the SVC in the aorta. These are all technical details. And then the aorta is clamped, uh, the heart is arrested, and the right pulmonary artery is opened. Now, when you open the right pulmonary artery, what happens is uh, because there's still perfusion, the patient's still being perfused and you've got uh, uh, even though the heart's arrested and you've got um, um, uh, blood going into the bronchial circulation, you'll have washback into the pulmonary circuit, um, which means that, that uh, when you start your endarterectomy, you can do it in the central, meaning the level one and even the level two, you can do it without arresting the circulation because the amount of blood that's washing back into your field can be sucked away fairly easily uh, so that you can achieve what you need to. But once you get beyond that level and you start going into the segmental areas, you need to stop the circulation. Um, and that means achieving circulatory arrest, which we do typically for periods of 20 minutes at a time before we reperfuse the patient. Um, there have been, there's been one study done, the, the PCOG trial, uh, which looked at really two groups of patients, about uh, 35 to 40 patients in each arm, one of whom had pure circulatory arrest and the other arm had, had anti-grade cerebral perfusion during the period of circulatory arrest, which is a little bit more complicated to do. Um, and the idea was, was, does it make a difference in cognitive function? And uh, all these patients had a you know, standard psychological assessment um, uh, uh, prior to admission, uh, post-discharge at three months and a year, and essentially they found that the addition of anti-grade cerebral perfusion does not add any extra protection, and there was very little cognitive impairment that was seen in these patients. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very safe strategy, and we use circulatory arrest uh, very commonly at this institution for other types of surgery, complex aortic surgery, aortic section. So the actual technique and the mechanism of doing it, we are extremely well versed in, and it's a strategy that allows us to do this operation safely. So um, we can go ahead and show the video, and you'll see here that the, 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 the heart's been arrested, and uh, we're now in the right pulmonary artery, and the whole key to the operation is achieving the right plane. You don't want to go too deep, as you see I did in that um, upper left corner. This is what you should see, sort of a silvery plane, and then develop that plane. And uh, it's just a matter of being patient, and you tease it out. Uh, here we're going into the lobar branches, and soon you'll see us uh, going down into the segmental branches. We're still working on the right uh, uh, pulmonary artery, and it's quite remarkable, really. When you look at a chest X-ray or, or you look at a CT scan, you, you know, you would think that 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 all that's going to be unreachable, but it's actually not that difficult to look down into the subsegmental bronchi, and you'll see that here on the left side. Those are actually, uh, th that's an endarterectomy from the, uh, uh, from the uh, basal branches of the left lower lobe. Um, and that's, that's, that's one specimen, but it's amazing how much clot you can get out in these, in these, in these individuals. Um, you want to go on? So this is just the experience from UC San Diego with their operative mortality. And now their oper operative mortality is down to 1% essentially. Yeah. So the complications that occur in these patients postoperatively, first of all, you've got a whole set of complications that are associated with anybody who has cardiac surgery, you know, arrhythmias, um, atelectasis, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Many of you may be, may be familiar with those. But the complications that are particular to this particular group of patients are, um, are, um, are hypoxia and, uh, and reperfusion injury um, of the lung. So hypoxia, for example, if you think about it, um, what you've done during the surgery is you have endarterectomized certain segments of the lung in which uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance was high. And by endarterectomizing them, you have now decreased the pulmonary vascular resistance there so that there is increased blood flow in those areas. When you compare the blood flow there, to other areas of the lung in which there was relatively little disease and where the PVR in those segments or subsegments was, was, was normal, you now have more blood flowing into the areas that were endarterectomized compared to the areas that were not. And as a result, you have a steel phenomenon. You have more blood going into the endarterectomized segment, but you have just as much ventilation. So 
picture this, you've got the same amount of ventilation, but you've got more perfusion, so as a result, you have a VQ mismatch. You've got less ventilation and more perfusion in these areas. You don't see it on the chest X-ray, but it's because of these VQ mismatches that occur that these patients will become hypoxic in the post-operative period. It doesn't mean that anything, you know, anything <laughs> abnormal is going on other than a natural consequence of what you've done. So you have to put them on oxygen, and it can take weeks or months to resolve. So you'll send them home on home oxygen therapy, and it doesn't mean that the operation has not been a success. You just have to be patient. By six months, almost all of them will be weaned off, uh, 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 weaned off the oxygen. Now, the other problem that can occur is reperfusion injury. And this happens, this is probably um, um, uh, a result of uh, increased capillary permeability in the areas where the endarterectomy has been performed. And also, uh, as has been shown by bronchial alveolar lavage, um, uh, where there's large amounts of uh, acute inflammatory components that are seen, there's an, there's an inflammatory component over here which is not surprising because any time you injure the body, whether it's an incision on the skin or whether it's a bruise from a blow or anything, any injury to the body induces acute inflammation. And every one of you knows what acute inflammation is, the various stages of acute inflammation. So here, what we are doing is we are injuring the lung by performing an endarterectomy in certain segments of the lung. So it's not surprising that you're setting up the conditions for acute inflammation. And this alveolar proteinosis and neutrophil migration, et cetera, is one of the issues that can lead to what you see, these patchy infiltrates on the on the chest X-ray. Now, this will occur to a greater or lesser degree in 10 to 40% of patients post-op. So it's almost a normal post-operative finding. It's very important to, to make patients aware of it because setting the expectations is really a huge part of the battle, that if they need to be on prolonged ventilation, that's not because the operation didn't succeed, it's because they developed one of the natural consequences of this operation. So you have to make them understand that their, that their post-operative course may be prolonged by these issues. They may even need to go on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation for a short period of time. Obviously, each time you escalate the intervention to a new level, there's a whole set of complications that are potentially associated with these. But done carefully, done by a team that is well-versed in this, you can bring most of these patients through so that they, they, uh, they, can, they can end up leading um, uh, productive, normal lives. So it's really, it's, it's different in the sense from the way we approach normal cardiac surgery where there is an expectation of almost immediate success, meaning within days. Over here, when you have a, quote, complication like this, um, it's really not a surprise. You say to yourself, well, you know a certain number of patients are going to have it, and you deal with it. It's part of the continuum of care in these patients that starts well before they come to surgery and continues really for the rest of their life. Sure. So, um this is, I think, something that we touched upon a little bit earlier about why, pa why, this, uh, why patients aren't referred for uh, thromboendotrectomy surgery more, uh, more often. And as we can see from, multiple, from a survey that was done, most providers kind of think that um, most providers don't refer for surgery because they think that the patient is too sick, unstable, or not fit for surgery, or they have contraindications. So I think the important message over here is everybody should be deferred for surgery and most patients can be operable candidates. So just to kind of wrap up with, with this patient, um, what happened after the surgery, uh, surgery went well, his Coumadin was continued and this is an important point because anticoagulation should be continued in these patients for life. And this is his echo one month post surgery and his RV size is better, RV function is uh, a little better as well. It's still bigger than the left, uh, ven it's still bigger than the left ventricle, but these findings take at least six months to kind of improve. And the degree of TR is also much less. This is his VQ scan post, uh, for one month post surgery, and we can see that the perfusion is kind of returned to the right middle lobe as well as the left lingular and left lower lobe as well. He still has some VQ mismatches, but much better than what it was preoperatively. 
And then just to touch upon briefly the role of medical therapy in these patients, um, it's only to be considered in patients that have, uh, that have recurrent pulmonary hypertension post-thromboendarterectomy or patients that are inoperable. Right now, Rioseguar is the first-line oral therapy, and this is the pivotal trial based on which it was made, uh, the first-line therapy. And Macitentin has also um, had a trial in, in uh, patients with inoperable CTEF and will be approved for uh, this indication as well. And then balloon angioplasty is also coming up. The role is kind of controversial, but for now it's to be considered in inoperable candidates or patients with recurrent uh, pH after the surgery. And for instance, in this example, we can see before BPA, there's an abrupt cutoff in this artery. After balloon dilatation, there's return of perfusion to this lower artery. So just an algorithm going over the management. Yeah, I think okay. maybe at this point, maybe we can we, we can start okay. take a, take a few questions before we wrap up. Would that be? Yeah, yeah I think we're over time. We'll take one or two questions um, and see if people have any uh, burning questions. Any questions? We can. Uh, what is the usual rate of recurrence? Uh, about 25%. So this is another expectation that you have to set for your patients. You have to tell them that a quarter of you will improve and then will get worse because the condition will recur. So setting expectations, as with any type of surgery, is extremely, um, uh, extremely uh, uh, important. Uh, you want to take the first one, pre-op anticoagulation failure? So the question is, uh, pre-op anticoagulation failure and recurrent CTEF, how does it affect the surgery results and what? So currently, as we all know, that the most of the data about the anticoagulation in uh, chronic thromboembolic pH comes from uh, UCSD, and, uh, and one of the anticoagulation which we all know uh, well is Coumadin, and uh, we have patients on that. We have started using the newer anticoagulants, but uh, lately in uh, patients who are triple positive, that means lupus anticoagulant, antiphospholipid, and beta, -gly beta 2 glycoprotein, um, there is a trial which was actually recently uh, was abruptly stopped because of the higher thromboembolic events in patients who were triple positive with rivaroxabine. So keeping that in mind, uh, we generally use uh, apexiban, we use comedin, we have patients on Lovenox, and uh, we use that. And post-operatively, uh, we basically, within 24 hours, uh, start uh, anticoagulation with heparin uh, in these patients. And as they improve, we slowly transition them to either Lovenox or, as I mentioned, to comedin or whatever is the uh, preferred or choice, uh, agent of choice in these patients. Uh, regarding comorbidities, uh, they're pretty similar to any other uh, dis any other surgical procedure, like if you have a very old patient, obese, or some other bad end-stage organ disease. Uh, however, we have done some high-risk patients with successful results, actually. Uh, but yes, those are the individual centers, and uh, a third of patients are actually who are referred for surgery. They are generally declined because of comorbidities, and as I mentioned, those are pretty similar for any major big surgery for you know, any other surgery you would not consider. I think we're- well, Activity uh, limitations. We try to make it as few as possible. Yeah. The biggest thing that you can do for your recovery after any kind of major surgery is to try to get as active as possible as soon as you can. And so we get them out of bed. Physical therapy is an extremely important component of this. Um, and um, you know, that's, the, the limitations are the same as they would be for anybody who's had a median sternotomy where we would place some uh, simple restrictions on driving for th you know, maybe three weeks or so and, and uh, limitations on how much they can lift and so on and so forth, but, but, but nothing beyond that. And we encourage them really to be as active as they can. Lower body exercise is extremely important. Patients will frequently say, you know, I have a second floor and my bedroom is upstairs. Shall I bring the bed down? The answer is no. You need to climb the stairs as often as you can. Yeah. It's great exercise. And after the surgery, you have uh, potentially cured them of the disease. So they are basically now disease free. Uh, uh, so they can actually do whatever activities they want to and maybe they, whatever they were not doing earlier. So uh, really no recommendation apart from a 
surgical things as part of recovery of that. Thank you. Thanks, Aditi, and thank you for the panel. So we'll move on to the next. Uh...